Sorry about that. Mr. Sivdiv, how are you? Two times in a week. Uh, doing good, man. Doing good. It's not early in the morning for me, but yeah. <laughs> we're chilling. Oh, it's not going to be that early there, is it? Man, it's 9 a.m. Last night, I, I woke up at 8 because I was getting ready for this interview. Yeah. But the night before that, I was like 1 p.m. waking up. Yeah. My sleep schedule is boom. It's oh, bad. shit. Flat <laughs> out, mate. Flat out. Yeah. That, well, that's the problem with uh, having YouTube. You might know this, too. Like, sometimes you'll go on an editing binge at 3 a.m. Yeah. And you you won't even remember what time it is until it's too late. Oh, no. Absolutely, <laughs> man. I, I can completely, like, um, sympathize with that. You're just starting something, going, 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 next thing. Absolutely flat out. That's how it works. Yeah. What did you think? Did you watch through the last um, last episode we did together? I did, man. Yeah, no, I watched it with my girlfriend. It was fantastic. Oh, uh, man, awesome. I was so glad to have that, and I was really excited to come on for the second time. Yeah. You know? Oh, man, no, I, re I really appreciate that. And uh, thank you to coming, for coming back on. Um, you know, I've had some really good stuff of out of Pe People love you. Um, as with everything, as with anything online, there's people that don't like you, but I get that all the time too. It's you put yourself out there, you're putting yourself out there to all sorts of risk, man. Of course, yeah. No, I've I've, I've gained a little bit more thick skin than uh, the earlier days in my channel. So, oh, yeah, yeah, it's good, man. It's the only it's the only way to do it. So, yeah. look, let's wind back to like the Ukraine war before the 24th of february of course the invasion happened on the 24th but before yeah. then did you have any inclination did you ever want to go to ukraine before that because there was a lot of foreign guys there at the time you know i had a lot of friends who wanted to go um but obviously this was before the the large invasion happened um you know since 2014 so like uh there wasn't a whole lot i mean there was a lot going on i mean you can see like a lot of videos coming out especially from coast like or like guys who are part of the og squad out there just there before it was cool yeah and uh i don't know i, I always had it in my mind but I, I never thought i would go there i thought it was gonna be a rock and then i was gonna get back home and just call quits but yeah yeah honestly so then the 24th happened and you know that happened very publicly all around the world you know just everything online bloody my video your video yeah. everyone um what was your initial feelings was your initial feeling if i'm gonna go and i'm gonna go here and fight or was it like how how did you see it yeah no it was absolutely that uh, as soon as the 24th came um i was with my buddy so it was my buddy and i we were the two people who had left shangal and we were going to be waiting to go back home mm. and he was actually going to go to ukraine and that was his plan and i i was always telling him like ah i don't know i mean if the war starts maybe uh but you know, right now I need a break. Yeah. And then the war started as we were in the airport city getting ready to go home. Um, I've been public about this on Instagram and like YouTube and stuff. And it, it literally happened like that. After a year and some change in Shengal, it happens as we're waiting to go back home. So I had to cancel my flight and then I decided I was going to go with him. Uh, he was a younger guy and uh, to my knowledge, he's still out there. Uh, he's still doing some great work. But yeah, I, I wanted to go there with him and I wanted to give it what I could, you know. And, and what made you want to go there? Like, you know, because, of course, if you are fighting for one side, you have you have obviously picked a side of that you believe are the good guys and the bad guys and wanting oh. to fight for one. What what made you make that decision? Because there's also people, primarily Italians, who have gone and fought uh, on, the, on the Russian side. Yeah. No, I've seen those as well. Um, that my, my decision was actually super fluid. Um, and I know for a lot of other, like, YPG and YBS vets, it was a very simple decision. Um, although the the two ideologies of the groups I was with before, if people watched that other interview that we did uh, you know, a couple of days ago, or uh, the group in Ukraine, the ideology might not be the same, but the, the cause is the same. They want their own land, and there is an invading force coming. It's, I mean, it was just super obvious to me. I mean, it was, that's all I needed. That's all I needed, like, in order to pick a side there. It, the invading force... In any of these countries, I mean, you have to have a really good reason. And I didn't see that reason at all. I don't think anybody does. So yeah. that's why I joined, yeah. Well, there's definitely people There's definitely people that, that do see that reasoning. But on that same note, if, you know, then in 12 months' time, Ukraine, you know, turned around to then invade Russian land, what what would your thoughts on that be? Would you think, well, that is that, oh, man. they've done the wrong thing, but that's their land, you know, how would you see that? Um, it depends, like, uh, if it's, if it's got a strategic thing, like, you can see how, uh, Ukraine bombs Belgorod, mm. but to actually invade, I would not agree with Ukraine do, doing that. Um, but obviously, I mean, 
I don't know. I, I wouldn't be too upset if Ukraine invaded some like Belarus or something, or maybe maybe a little bit north uh, into into Russia because they're the invading force and they need to be stopped whatever way. If yeah. they think that's a better decision to end this war quicker, I think that's a, an all right decision. Oh, um, it's a it's a very interesting um, perspective as someone like yourself who you know, yeah, I guess you just the way you put it is you fight invading forces. And even if, am I correct in saying, even if your ideology, your ideology doesn't feel the same, I guess you believe in people's right to sort of freedom and have their own, like, uh, peace and home? Is that, so, like, well, sorry, what I'm trying to say is even if your ideology yeah. doesn't match uh, those that you're defending, then you believe in that. Exactly, yeah. Mm. I mean, I, I would lean myself more towards the ideology of Ukraine than YBS and YPG, personally. Yes. But it's just the the fact that, you know, it's an invading force. They just want their own land. Everybody, all the civilians agree, or most of them do, you know, that, hey, this should be a country. Hey, you know, like, we're just doing our own thing. I I think it's completely justified at that point to, to join them and help them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess that takes into account, though, because there are a lot of people in the far east of Ukraine, which I'm sure that you've had a lot to do with, that actually are on the separate, that are born to join Russia. Sure. Um, have you, sure. Had, have sure. you had much... Um, to do with with those people out there because i know when i was in the east when i was working out there filming that the people yeah. that are left the people in these towns and villages that are left out there majority um because if you're if you're living in a village that's been bombed for now when i was there in the end you know six months solid the people that are remaining there are probably the ones who are more uh, on the pro-Russian side. That, of course, doesn't mean all of them, but, you know, we were getting a lot of warnings about, hey, if you're going to such and such, the people remaining may call a bomb on you, may shoot at you. Um, have you had a, a lot to do with those with those people, the pro-Russian Ukrainians? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, there were some, you know, in, in one of the units, I, I can't speak about a whole lot. Um, I haven't been public about it too much. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was specifically dealing with pro-Russian uh, like actors and saboteurs and stuff that are within Ukraine. Mm. And yeah, I mean, we saw that firsthand. Um, we, we talked to them and everything. Some of them were there because they knew that the opportunities to get money from Russia to go and do these acts was coming. And some of them are addicted to drugs in that way. Um, but others, yeah, others are just simple civilians and they just agree with Russia. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't think any foreigner, anybody outside of Ukraine or outside of that, sort of Eastern European influence, um, like growing up there or whatever it is, can fully understand the situation there. And I, I don't I don't even try to. Yeah. Um, other than, you know, it's an invading force and I think it's kind of obvious to the world. It um, is it's yeah, a very different situation. Need, so. Yeah, yeah man, and, and that's all you needed so, to go and to potentially lay down your life for. Yeah, yeah. For me personally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. So what was the date that you decided you were gonna go and and fight for Ukraine? Was it day oh, one? I think it was like, I think it was day one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that's exactly when I made the decision. You know, my buddies were talking about, it, like I said, they, they wanted to join and um, for, for like a long time. Mm. And then when the war started, I, I knew that they weren't just blowing smoke. I, I knew it was, this is an actual threat and here it is. It, it actually happened. Yeah. So, yeah, and then we just, yeah. I, I don't think, I don't think much of the world knew that it was going to happen at that point, but it did. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I was there and we didn't know it was going to happen. Pe people who, everyone who tells me, oh, I saw this coming, I'm like, you're full of shit. Um, <laughs> because I was like, I was there and I was there with the Ukrainians in the east, in the Donbass Oblast, in, Do in Donetsk, sort of Oblast, Donbass area. Like, none yeah. of us fucking knew. Like, there was rumors, but there's been rumors for eight years. No one knew. Um, that, yeah, it was one of those things and no one knew then we went. So how long after the start did you actually, you know, board the plane and fly to, I'm guessing you flew to Poland and cross. Yeah. Yeah. It was exactly Poland. Um, it was as soon as possible. So for me, I think it was like a week after it started. So like March 3rd, we, if I remember correctly, March 3rd, we had flown out of Iraq we took a couple uh, layovers into Poland. And then when we got to Poland, yeah, we just crossed in. So I think it was like March 5th or 6th that we were in uh, Ukraine. Yeah. Oh, shit. And what was the situation like when you'd crossed in? Uh, situation was crazy. Uh, I'm sure you know this. Uh, I remember at the border, like that. The, the weirdest thing at the start was, oh man. Well, if we could take it back, when I got to Poland, uh, we decided, okay, well, none of us came here like prepared. You know, we didn't have time to go and order body armor and stuff. So, let's hit up a, a 511 shop. Maybe they got some military gear. So we get to this 511 like actual retail shop, 
in Poland and it was completely empty. Yeah. And we we're like, Oh, and we're talking to the store owner and he's just giving us everything. They, they brought off the ghillie suit off the, off the mannequin and gave it to my buddy, my yeah. sniper friend. Uh, they gave it to, uh, they gave like everything that they had for free. They said, just go in here, take whatever you need. We, we got like cold weather stuff. We got, because it's pretty cold at that time. Um, and everything. And they literally had just taken everything from that shop and delivered it to Ukraine for free out of his own pocket. <laughs> and that's one of the guys that I want to support, um, you know, financially, like, you know, uh, you know, we talked about this in the last interview, but yeah, I mean, there's amazing people like that. Oh, there's, there's amazing uh, people everywhere, mate, who are, who are just like that doing just incredible work. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it was really uh, heartwarming, you know, and then crossing into Ukraine, uh, we decided to take, I think it was a bus took a train at some point i think we took a bus first crossed through wasn't too bad uh they just check our visas make sure we don't have any like legal problems back home and we just got into ukraine with a visa on arrival and uh the first thing you see is just uh like oh god probably 10 kilometers line of of like supply trucks coming out of ukraine it was like people like moving out yeah. we're like the only people going forward uh so it was a, it was a little weird that way but it wasn't anything I was not used to. Like in Syria, we used to see the same thing, and that, that just means there's war. You just see a 10-kilometer line of, uh, of families and everybody. It's crazy. Yeah, so once you got yeah. in, you, I guess, make um, connections to the Foreign Legion. Is that correct? Um, no, it was actually um, – I was with a, a group of people, uh, other volunteers. We were trying to go and find each other because – we had all just joined, but it's better to be together. You can make a better decision. Yeah. So I, I found a, I found a group of people, and uh, the person who was sort of the commander of that group, uh, he decided that a, he's got a connection with uh, a training group out there in Lviv, and that was the first thing we did was, hey, they're going to give us free boarding, free food, everything we need if we just train them for a little bit. And I think this would be a good way to get our you know our feet wet, you know, just take it nice and slow. And that that was the decision we all made together. Yeah. Yeah. And at what point did you, I guess, separate from there and then go and um, sign up to, to fight? Yeah, so it, it wasn't with the Foreign Legion. Um, our group, after a couple of days of training, we did you know some good work. It, it was fantastic, uh, training the territorial defense. And after that, I think uh, maybe three days in that training, uh, we got another contact that was down in Mikulayev. And we wanted to go to Mikulayev because that was one of the top front lines at that point. Yes. And that, that was when we decided, okay, let's go there. I think just before we had went there, the Russians had pushed in like north of Meek Live as well. Yeah. And then I think the day or like a, the day before or whatever that we arrived, uh, they'd been pushed back to sort of the eastern part of the Meek Live region. So we knew that it wasn't just a suicide. Uh, so yeah, we decided to go to Meek Live uh, altogether and you know, do some, do some on the ground work, which is what we we're there for. Not so much uh, training. We all wanted to sort of take part in the front line uh, when they needed it most, you know? So how did you take part in that? You know, you're, you're there with a couple of guys, you know, in your group. How does yeah. that work? Like just going to the front line, like how, how I'm guessing you don't have weapons. You're not, you know, you're not official Ukrainian soldiers or foreign legion. How does that actually work other than being, I guess, a small militia force? Yeah. So for ourselves, uh, I don't, I don't know exactly who got the contact or what it was, but when we got to Meek Live, we, we went to the base first and I, I forget if it was a Meek Live or in some other city. Uh, but it, it was close to Meek Live and we got there and they gave us weapons. They issued us body armor, you know, full camouflage, two sets of it, everything we needed, you know, a belt, boots, anything. And with that, they also gave us our AK 74s. And some of my friends already had weapons uh, who were already in Meek Live, some of the guys I was with. Um, but, yeah, they, they gave us everything they, they needed, and we were going to actually work with them, not as, like, a separate thing, but together, if that makes sense. We wanted to be together as internationals, but we wanted to work for the Army, and they yeah. just took us in. Yeah, yeah right. Did, did they check your, like, service histories? Did they – because you could have just been anyone. Like, I know you've, yep. got, a, I know you've got a service history, but you could have just yeah. been – some shit kicker rock up who just wants to play, wants to play commando. Yeah, no, totally. No, they, they checked everything. Uh, they checked their military records. They asked us questions. They sort of 
interviewed us a little bit. And uh, after that point, then they gave us the weapons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of so, course. Of course. And yeah. <laughs> what, what, unit, what unit was that, if you can say? Oh, man. I, honestly, that was I was only with that unit for like two weeks, technically. Yeah, right. I don't even remember. But it, it was uh, – they were doing a lot of great work. They were the ones who were really withstanding the Russian invasion at you know since the very start. So uh, it, it was a great unit. It was a great unit. And you said that they were sort of doing their own thing and you guys almost standing off to the side doing a bit of your own. What what did that work consist of? Yeah, so I, I actually didn't take part in any of the other missions. I only did one mission with those guys specifically. Right. I've been in like three different groups out there. Yeah, it seems uh, like it seems like every foreigner has been in like, yeah, I've shifted <laughs> eight groups and different nationalities and <laughs> yeah. all this. I'm like, oh, Jesus. They're just, yeah, f- a bit of grass is greener. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, no, I, I had only been there for two weeks. And then um, when I when I first got there, actually, we we were, you know, we, we got to the Meek Live area. We were chilling a bit. And then we had the idea to go and bring uh, three of us, including myself, to Kiev. Uh, when it was at that point where it was almost surrounded. Uh, but we wanted to go to Kiev to get some proper paperwork. That way we could have the the sort of like license, I guess, to be able to carry into other regions. So we had our weapons, we had our gear, and we wanted to make sure that we could travel with our gear. Yeah. Because none of us feel safe without a weapon. You know, we want to be able to go other places. So yeah, uh, we had went to Kiev and uh, yeah, Kiev was cool. And it was just a... Uh, Man, can I actually say a story about that? I, I know I'm going on a little no, tangent. No, no, go, go. Tangents is what we're about. Mate. You, <laughs> go for absolutely. it. Absolutely. Stories are the best, mate. That's what people, people, and I'll speak for the listeners here. People want to hear these, like, these stories because it's so much different to other other stuff. Well, I haven't said the story before, so th- this will be cool. Awesome. Uh, we went to Kiev, and it, at that point, right when we arrive, uh, we get into contact with one of my friends who is going with me. So it's three of us. And the contact... We had no idea. I had no idea. But he had, he literally took us to the parliament building or some sort of giant political building right outside Maidan Square. Oh. And like you can go on the balcony outside this place. It's a huge, huge like political building. I don't know what it is. But you walk out and you're like like 100 meters from Maidan Square. And uh, that's where we were staying at that point. It's changed now, but that's where we were staying. And it was really, really strange. And at that point, Zelensky was uh, on Instagram. He was showing, I don't know if anybody remembers this, probably not, but he was on Instagram posting, I'm not kidding, less than a kilometer away, I think like even 300 meters away in a, in a building on Bank Bankova Street, if I remember correctly. But he was he was showing like, this is where I am, Russians, go fucking kill me. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that was, that was like 300 meters away. It was just, it was crazy how... Uh, it was just a very strange moment. But when I had, when I had first arrived there, if I can take it back, when, when I arrived there, they took us to that to that big building. And when we got into the building, we're walking through. There's guards, obviously. And we walked into this area, a uh, big area of this, uh, this giant building. And we opened up the doors. And I see, like, ten internationals. And one of them, I had no idea was there. But it's my friend from seven months ago in Shengal. I had no idea he was in Ukraine, and I randomly see him. And there's not many people in Shengal on YBS. Yeah. There was, like, at the time that I was in, like, 10. And uh, I see my friend there just standing there, and I'm like, come on. And he just looks over, like, what the hell? <laughs> you know, like, you can imagine. It's just, like, we, the last time we saw each other was in Iraq. I, you know, I wasn't keeping up with them. We just find each other there. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, we, we just stayed there. We got the paperwork. Uh, we met some other internationals. They would go off to go and join different units, but we were there just to get paperwork, which we got, and then we uh, came straight back to Meek Live. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, sort of back in a join. And how many of those sort of guys, you know, the international fighters uh, from the YBS, YPG, things like that, actually came across to fight? Uh, I, I I don't know exactly, but uh, I know I know quite a few. No, quite a few. Some of them are vocal uh, about them being there. Some aren't. So I'm not going to say an exact number, but yeah, yeah you can find them everywhere. One of them uh, got an interview on CNN. He's uh, my good buddy, uh, Zoffer. Yeah. Yeah. Did you run into a lot of guys there who had no military experience, no combat experience, you know, trying to sort of play soldiers? And we, we called them when I was, because I was in Kiev at the exact same time as yourself. LARPers. Um, LARPers or um, we, we used to refer to them as fictional characters. That they're a fictional, fictional character characters. in their own in their own fucking head. 
Um, <laughs> did you did you come across a lot of these? Because I know so many clients hit me up. Like, I'm looking for a unit. I'm like, oh, like, well, one, I can't help yeah. you with that. It's not my job. It's well outside of my reach as a journalist. But like, what experience you got? They're like, oh, no, none. I just want to come. And I'm like, no. Uh, did you come across yeah. much of that? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, especially in that Kiev thing. Um, a lot of guys, I mean, I'll be, I'll be honest, like most of the people who come to Ukraine don't have, a lot of them are mostly military, like they have military background, but none of them are have combat experience, which is actually pretty important if you were to go there. But yeah, no, we, we also met plenty of people who had no experience at all, and they just wanted to come and help. Mm. Um, yeah, it freaks me out. I, I would never trust them in combat. I wouldn't want to be in the same unit, but at the same time, you know, I don't, I don't judge them for their decision. I, I guess too much, um, but yeah, mm. I've met a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, no, that that makes sense. And there are so many of those, both in like trying to fight and also like people who are like, oh, I'm part of this NGO. Who you're like, what are you actually doing though? Like at that point in Kiev, aren't they like, oh, I'm a I'm a NGO who's doing you know trauma aid. And I'm like, why are you in Kiev? Like, like, yeah. like okay, Kiev maybe late Feb, early March, but then mid March. April and I was there, I'm like, there's nothing here. Like, <laughs> like what are you doing? Yeah. yeah. I'm taking sick Instagram photos though. Yeah. And you know, like, yeah, when I, when I had went out East, which we'll talk about, mm. you know, probably after Meek Live and stuff, but when I went out East and then we would take leave back to Kiev and Chernobyl and places like that, way in the rear, that's where we really saw the, we saw a lot of, uh, a lot of people like that still in, still in Kiev doing, doing, I don't know what, but yeah, yeah a lot of people like that, man. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, so after, after you left Kiev, you're back to Mykolaiv? Yeah. And right after Kiev, we stayed there for two days mm. and we went straight back to Kiev, uh, straight back to Mykolaiv after we got the paperwork. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're back down, join a same or different unit to go and, to go and fight and defend? Yeah, it was the same unit. We just went back there and we we're like, Hey, we got the paperwork. Mm. And at that point they had, uh, they were right outside Mykolaiv. That's where we were staying at that point. And uh, I was in this barracks. We were with uh, with the army. We had our weapons, everything we needed. And I think I spent like two nights there, uh, just just waiting for an operation. Yeah. And yeah. So at what yeah. point did you get that? I guess first operation against uh, the Russian forces. Well, <laughs> I, I think a lot of people are curious. That's the, you know, the that video now on my YouTube has ten million views. Uh, oh. It's it's nuts. People are curious about it. And the backstory behind it is uh, when I went to Meek Live, you know, two days had passed. We were just not doing much. The night before we were – sorry if I, sorry if you can hear the construction in the other room, by the way. That's all right. That'll, uh, be, that'll be fine. Okay. But uh, we had gotten there, and then um, the night before the, the first mission, there was some artillery that came in. Uh, it was far away, like a kilometer away or something. But that was our first time here in artillery, so we knew, okay, we're at the front now. Like, we're, we're pretty close. And then in the morning, probably around, like, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., we all woke up. We were just getting up, smoking cigarettes, eating breakfast, just chilling. Uh, just, you know, trying to figure out our gear. We weren't prepared yet. We weren't ready for a mission. But then the Ukrainians that came with a, uh, uh, like, a, a group of people who they wanted to go to the front line and – they needed bodies to go to the front line. So the commander, the general of that area, of that unit, um, he had went to our barracks and asked for four international volunteers to go there with this group of uh, Ukrainians. We're going to do a recon, mm -hmm. just a recon. And we're like, okay, hell yeah. Um, and uh, the we had three people who went immediately. They said, yeah, yeah, I want to go, I want to go. And they still needed that fourth slot. And that fourth slot was open for about an hour. And I... I, you know, I was talking to my friends and I'm like, what should I do? I, I know that we don't want to separate. Yeah. One of the first things that, that we told ourselves was we're a big 20 man group that the worst thing that can happen to us early on is that we all start to separate and we get to different units and we, we just sort of disband. Yeah. We're more powerful together. And that's how we got into this position. It's better to stay together. So I was sort of weighing that option. I'm like, should I go on this recon, get my feet wet, like with, the, with my buddies and people I trust as well, or should I stay here? And at that point I the fourth slot wasn't coming up and I decided, okay, I'll go. Um, so yeah, I left on that first mission in the, in the morning, just uh, two hours after the decision was made. Right. And you, can you talk us through yeah. that first mission? Yeah. So there, there's a lot going on. Um, you know, the video's out there, but uh, 
the first thing was the recon. So we, uh, after we gathered two more people who were not military trained, we talked about this in the last interview, but uh, they had no military training. It wasn't their fault. They didn't lie, but it was my, my friend who had said that they're French foreign legion. They aren't. And so now it was six of us going there, three of us with no um, uh, military training at all, and three of us with military training. Uh, or no, I think it was two without military training, one or two of us without like combat experience, then two of us with combat experience of some of some sort. So anyway, it was it was ragtag, it was kind of shit, but luckily it's just gonna be a recon. Mm. So we uh, we get into the car, uh, we start a convoy with like three or four cars, just regular civilian cars, and we get to this village that was recently liberated, and uh, we just went there. We were told that there might be some Russians here, but we know that there's some some left behind equipment. We need to check that out. So we went there. We spent about an hour there. Uh, there was a search team that was Ukrainian, and they went and. Uh, you know, there's probably like 35 of us at this point. And yeah, about a five man search team went out, checked it out, said, yep, it's all good. We set up some drones, made sure the surrounding is good. We talked to the civilians, just doing a typical recon and everything was good. And at that point, the, uh, the general came back and he said, Hey, this area is all clear. Now, if you guys want to go and push up to the, the Eastern side of the city, so closer to the Russians and spend the night there, I think that'd be really valuable. That way we can have an eye on the Russians if they, you know, because the, the front line is changing constantly, kilometers each day at this point, early on. So he wanted us to go there, and we all said, yeah, that sounds good. I mean, this is different than the, what we had planned, but we'll do it. So we, uh, we drive over to that other, that on the eastern side of this town. It's probably about uh, two more kilometers of driving. And we get to this house that was already bombed out. It was already bombed out like crazy. And... Um, I'll share some videos and stuff. I mean, all the windows are broken. Uh, you know, there's there's there was this crater that was uh, uh, must have been from like a fused uh, artillery shell that didn't go off, but it dug itself into the concrete like a meter or two, and it's just this hole right in front of the door. Um, so UXO that somebody has to clean up now. But we got there, and then okay, we got to spend the night here. We don't have sleeping bags. We weren't prepared that way, so they end up getting. We end up splitting off. Uh, so now there's six of us there, uh, like I said, and three of us decided to go back and retrieve uh, some sleeping bags and some stuff for the night, and the three of us were going to stay there. And at that point, they had left, and about 30 minutes after they left, um, during that 30 minutes, we had just barricaded the walls. We had made sure all the windows are good, me and the uh, fighting positions in case the Russians were to come. Uh, the, the view that we had wasn't wasn't great. Uh, we had a forest about 50 meters away, sort of ahead of us, and then we couldn't see much after that. And to the behind us and and sort of like uh, the right and left flanks were also just houses and stuff. So it was really, it wasn't the best place to do any like, I don't know, some LPOP sort of action, listening post, observation post. It wasn't the best. But anyway, we were there, and 30 minutes after you know we had barricaded everything, uh, some artillery starts to come in. Uh. And it comes in kind of close. It wasn't super close, but it came in close. And close enough where it you know, was shaking the building. It was starting to get a little, a little freaky. So we, uh, we all decide, okay, uh, we need to maybe think about getting into a cellar because we see that they've hit this building before, mm -hmm. and they know that we we're here because they're artillery. So... We wanted to go back. So as we're walking back to the cellar, they start getting artillery a little bit closer and closer. And we end up getting to a cellar about 100 meters rear of this place and just staying there, waiting for the other three people to, to arrive. Because if, if the Russians were to invade right now, we got three of us. We have, like, no weapons except for a couple, of like, RPG-22s, these tiny little single-use launchers. Uh, so we waited there for about an hour. And after that, we decided to come back to that, to that base and as soon as we arrived, about 10 minutes later, the other car came. And they didn't come with uh, the sleeping bags and stuff. They came with news. And they said, hey, uh, the people on the front line, the people that are about two kilometers from here, they need help right now. We're pushing the Russians. And they need us to go there as soon as possible. They need bodies out there right now. And we we had no choice. Like, uh he asked us, but everybody was like, okay, I mean, we're here. They need bodies. You're saying that they need people right now and we're here? Okay. Uh, so as we're driving to the front line, because now they took us in the car as soon as we arrived. So the, the 
you know, first of all, I, I want people to know that the plan keeps changing. There is, there is, it came from you wake up in the morning, nothing's happening to, okay, a recon. We need four volunteers. Okay. And we do the recon and then, Hey, we're going to sleep the night here. Okay, cool. That sounds good. And then, nope, we're pushing to the front line. That's how it happened. Uh, I had no helmet at this point, no helmet at all. It wasn't issued one. Uh, the body armor was issued the day before. I had no body armor before that. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that, yeah, it was just, it was, it was a clusterfuck. <laughs> so yeah, we end up uh, driving to the front line. And as we're driving to the front line, we're, we're texting the, the internationals back at the way back there now. And we're saying, Hey, uh, the plans have changed. I don't know if you guys can come out here, but we're pushing to the front now. They need bodies. And they're like, okay, we can't do it today, but we might be able to do it tomorrow. And we're like, okay, as we're driving there. And artillery starts to rain in right on the road. And you can see in the video as well, right on the road that we were just on like two minutes prior because we're driving pretty fast and starting to come in. And that was our first time hearing artillery and seeing it like that close. And we're like, oh shit, you know, it's becoming real. And we, we didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. We were, we were hyped. We were, we were excited to do this job, but you never really know how you're going to react in your first like actual combat experience, you know? So we, man, it, it was people, people oftentimes called their, their first combat experience a baptism by fire. And it was, it was definitely that, you know, uh, we show up and right before we get into the, the trench, you know, right before we, we get to the front line, uh, some tank rounds come in. You can see on the video as well. It smacks. We have got three or four cars that are going to, you know, like, uh, reinforce them. And, uh, some tank shells come in whiz past uh, some of them hit like a couple meters in front of the lead vehicle, which has my team leader and uh, um, my other friend. And luckily it didn't have any splash, but it was just right there. There's the war. It's right here. And at that point we all dismount. We're like, shit, we got to, so we all turn right into the village and we dismount. And from there we, sorry, is this too rambly? No, not at <laughs> all, mate. This, uh... is, this is great. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. The more information, <laughs> the better, water. mate. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of this you can see in the video, but, uh, yeah, we, we had literally dismounted. We didn't know where the hell we were. We didn't know the, where the Ukrainians were, Russians were. It was complete chaos. We had no idea. And as soon as we arrived, you can see in the video, the Ukrainian tanks and, and stuff, they are retreating. Now, it's not their – obviously, it wasn't their, their call. They're doing it out of their own safety. And one of them were to be blown up just five minutes later. You know, um, we heard the explosion as we were driving back. We, we saw the destroyed BMP. Uh, the Ukrainians were retreating at that point, but we were rushing in. We were, we didn't know what to expect. So we get to this trench line, which I didn't even know existed. Um, so we get to the trench line. It wasn't trench. It was more of like a gully mm. underneath the bridge. And when we got there, there was Ukrainians everywhere. Nobody shooting a gun. So I was just like, okay, I guess we're, we're pretty chill. There was some small arms fire coming in. Uh, either from a tank, machine gun, some sort of something, but a small arms fire wasn't over. And then some more artillery. And, you know, we, we sort of got separated because there's like 30 Ukrainians in here and we start talking to the Ukrainians and we're like, Hey, what's up? What's up? Most of them are volunteers. I, I found out, I would find out afterwards that all these guys, if not like, if not all, like most of them are volunteers, the Ukrainian military, as far as I know, was told, Hey, you guys need to back off your, you know, because they had just made a push. It's not their job to defend. So they take a, they take a big chunk of uh, Russian land and then they back the hell out of there before the artillery comes. Mm. And, uh, they replace it with, I don't know. It's not cannon fodder. It's just a defensive line. I, you know, some people are like, Oh, you're just cannon fodder. No, it's, it's a defensive line. They needed bodies and you know, some volunteers. Awesome. Just get some rifles and some rockets. You guys can probably hold this. So that's what they did. As far as I know. And the, so we were there, and the artillery starts to come in pretty close uh, in the in the village right behind us where we parked the cars. So uh, everybody, all the Ukrainians started saying, get underneath the bridge, get underneath the bridge. We're like, okay. We get underneath the bridge, and as soon as we get underneath the bridge, we're just gathering everything. We're told that the Russians are pushing. You know, we're starting to get sort of surrounded. You know, where artillery's coming in, and when artillery comes in, you sort of, you get together. You're like, and you're supposed to get dispersion, but you want communication. You want you want comfort. You don't know what the hell is going on. Nobody knows. So we all sort of gather together underneath this bridge. We're like, okay, this is the safest place. And then artillery starts raining right on top of the bridge, uh, like right in front of the bridge, behind the bridge, inside the trench as well. I have no idea how nobody was injured in our trench. I have no idea. Um, my GoPro didn't pick out the, from the lighting. There's a lot of lighting 
because I was in a dark place underneath the bridge and then the lighting's like, uh, you know, yeah, so it screwed up the lighting, but there's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a bunch of impacts like 20 meters away, uh, you know, freaked the hell out of us. And it, and it, and it kept happening. There would be a barrage, 20 minutes would pass, a barrage would come. And obviously my, my GoPro, I mean, I'm not focusing on my GoPro right now, but I turn it off to make sure, you know, I'm not wasting battery. Um, because I, you know, we think that we're going to be pushing or get into a fight. So I'm just like, okay, you know, I'll just press it off. And then it would, it would, as soon as the artillery would come in again, I just get on the ground and then right when it'd be over, I turn on the GoPro because I'm not focusing on the GoPro. Yeah. And then, a lot of people like to say, no, you never went there on tour. Man, ask anybody there. It was, it was literally, you don't focus on your GoPro when you're out there. <laughs> no. um, but yeah, uh, we were underneath that bridge, and my uh, team leader had left that bridge. Uh, he went out to go and check on the people. In the, uh, there's a people on this little berm about 20 meters in front of us, and they had uh, uh, one of them was killed, and I think another injured. And he had came back to us and he said, yeah, some of those guys are injured. But, uh, yeah, here we are. It looks like uh, some of the guys are pushing. We might be pushing next. And I don't know if you saw, you know, the video or if anybody, you know, is, is thinking back at it. It's just an open field. And they want to do an infantry push. And we didn't have any support as far as we know. Uh, we heard some artillery uh, hitting the Russians, but we were just getting smoked, you know, just sitting here. So we wanted anywhere except for there. So, yeah, the, um, the Ukrainians came. And they, uh, they said, hey, we, uh, we're going to be pushing. And the team leader then told us, hey, we're going to be pushing. So we waited about 10 minutes outside of the, the bridge, ready to hop into the car. And then they, uh, they got us into the car. Uh, and that was, that was the – a lot of people say it's like a Call of Duty cutscene. And that's, uh, that's kind of what it was. It was literally this guy, this Ukrainian guy. You know, he's got the, the scar on his, you know, on his cheek and he's handing his vodka. And he's like – we're going to be going out there and, and going to the Russians and yeah, they packed us in the car. It was super crammed. I was like, I was like this, you know, the entire car ride. You can't see my feet, but I'm sitting on my ankles. Uh, and it was like four of us and we just started driving to the front, uh, to the very, very front on the other side because the Russians were surrounding and that's why they wanted us to push. So as we're driving there, impacts are coming in right on the road in front of us. Uh, you can see, you know, the splash as it comes up, just freaky stuff. And you're just in a little, little car. And, uh, yeah, at, at that point, yeah, we, you know, the guy starts shouting, like, uh, we're going to kill, go kill them. We're going to go kill the Russians. And I'm like, I, I asked like, who are we killing? Like, what's going on? Like, I, because I was asking about like, is it Russian soldiers, tanks, what's going on? And the, they just say Russians. And I'm like, okay, we're killing the Russians. And we, uh, yeah, we pushed in, and right when we got to uh, the front area, the the place, uh, the house is adjacent to us, about 20 meters, had been bombed to hell. You could see all the smoke. And we hop out of the car because we'd just taken artillery close. We're like, okay, we need to dismount and get into a, to a, to a building. That's the only cover there is. So I, I jump out, and my sling on my rifle is tied to everything. Everything is confused. My Man, one of, the, one of the guys who didn't have military experience, He's a good guy, but he had taken a gas mask he found in one of the other things as, like, a souvenir, and it was tied against my rifle's magazine. So, like, I'm, like, trying to get this mag this uh, gas mask that's tied to it. It's stuck to the car, and I'm, like, trying to get everything off. And, as, you know, before I can get everything off, I'm trying to stay calm and, like, just get everything off. The artillery starts to come in, and it comes in. Boom, boom. There's two shots, and it goes right over my head. It hits the building uh, behind us about 20 meters away. And... You know, I we could have been dead meat, uh, but that happened. And as soon as that happened, it woke us up. We're like, okay, we got to go. So I take off everything, and I run to the house, and I tell everybody, get over there, go, go. So we get to the to the house, and um, you know, we're I'm like, hey, we got to shoot down this door. We got to shoot down. So we get ready to shoot it down, and before we can shoot it down, some more artillery comes, and that's where I get down. You know, get into the prone. I mean, that's what you do, and when indirect fires come and I get down and prone and boom, 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 all these shots like ring out, like right next to us. And, uh, we hop back up and now nobody, nobody's like, you know, thinking, okay, how do I shoot down a log? My buddy just goes in there. He's like, I try to kick it down. And then right after my kick doesn't work, he just blasts it up with like 10 shots. <laughs> have a small yuck. And, uh, as soon as that opens, you know, I, I ran over because, uh, you know, I need, I need to see where everybody else was. And I, I grab my buddy and I, I push everybody inside. I'm trying to get everybody inside as quick as possible. And remember, most of these people never had military training and they're in this scenario. Mm. All right. 
So now my team leader is nowhere to be found. I have no idea where he is. Um, and you know, I'm the most experienced person at that point. We have another guy who's super experienced, uh, but uh, combat, you know, not so much because he was in the Ukrainian military for a while, but uh, it, it was more like holding the line. Wow. So yeah, uh, the, we, we were just in this house and they just started bombing some more and I'm trying to figure out, you know, I don't want to get, I don't want to get locked in there. So I'm trying to, I'm asking questions. I'm like, okay, where is everybody at? Where's our team leader? What's going on? You know, what's the situation? Did anybody see Russians? You know, I was asking these questions and uh, we don't know what's going on. And then our team leader shows up and <laughs> it's nuts. He walks up, he just walks up in the middle of this bombardment. He's like, hey, hey, hey how are you guys doing? Everything good? I'm like, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he just like, he's just like pointing at that direction. He's like, yeah, there's some Ukrainians there. Uh, I don't see the Russians yet. And he's just standing there. <laughs> he's got balls of steel. This guy's super experienced, by the way. Yeah. Um, super experienced, as you can tell. And that, that's the mark of an experienced person versus inexperienced. Like we were hiding in the house. Experienced person is just calm, collected, trying to gain information. And that, that was beautiful to see. It was really, really good uh, to learn from his, from his, uh, you know, team leader, Abilities, not not so much on the on the communication, but more on the staying calm and chill. That's really really important in combat. I would learn. So yeah, the um, to finish it up. Yeah, the we you know I, I knew that this house was too small, so I went to the next house right next to us, and I had, you know it was locked, so I shot open the lock, and we all go in. Uh, we knew there was no Russians there because you know we know that the Ukrainians are in the position next to us, and. At that point, my team leader had left to go and check on the Ukrainians. They had some casualties. Uh, there's just like five of them out there. We have no idea where we are, who, where the Russians are, where the Ukrainians are. We just got bombed the hell. There's casualties. And my friend had taken, as far as I know, he, I mean, he's got a, a laceration on his hand. I don't know if it's from artillery or what it was, but he's got a laceration on his hand and it's bleeding. So my buddy packed him up. Uh, so it's just complete hell. We have no idea what's going on. We got casualties over there, casualty amongst us, and then we hear jets start to fly over and uh, we don't know what they bombed, if they bombed, but I'm only guessing it's Russian. And so we get down to the prone and we held this house for about three hours in the artillery. And the artillery would still come. I just didn't turn on my GoPro. It would still come every 10 minutes, boom, 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 boom. And the Russians, we can hear the tanks in the distance. We can hear different things. The jets coming in. We think that the Russians are steamrolling this right now. We saw the casualties. We saw the situation on the ground. The Ukrainian tanks had fallen back. We're just infantry going up against this stuff. Yeah. So at that point, we uh, we decided, okay, we need to get some more, more reinforcements or get the hell out of here. So uh, in order to get the cellular connection, we had to move back a little bit. So we decided, okay, let's. Uh, we the team leader came back and he said, hey, if you guys want to go back and get this uh, some reinforcements, I think that'd be good. Uh, if you guys just want to go back, that that's not a bad idea. This is not looking like a good situation. But he's going to stay there with the Ukrainians because those are. You know, he knows those people. He's Ukrainian as well, my team there. Um, and yeah, uh, that happened. And we, we had backed up. We started texting, couldn't get cellular connection. We got into the car, go further back. And we were a little worried at that point because we could hear drones. I knew it wasn't a Bayrak tower like the Ukrainians have. I knew it was some sort of Orlon. And yeah, that that uh, that happened. And we started uh, pushing back. And as we're pushing back, we see just lines of, uh, we saw the tank that was destroyed. It's burning in the distance, uh, just like, you know, 500 meters away, but on the road. So that tank I had seen earlier that had fallen back and there's multiple of them. One of them was hit. Um, and there was just, it was just mayhem. There's freaking smoke everywhere. The, the place had been bombed to shit. As you look back at the village, it's just like getting destroyed. Um, and it wasn't until we had fallen back, uh, to the rear line about three kilometers away that we meet the, the other people. And when we meet the other people, it's not just the Ukrainian army, it's also the volunteers. Uh, so like the, the people, the Ukrainian volunteers who had went out there, everybody had fallen back, except for us. Mm. Uh, that, that was, the, that was a, a big wake-up call, and it was, it was nice for me to, to hear that, you know, because I was, I was afraid that, you know, I, I don't want to go off the line if there's more people and stuff. Everybody had left. Everybody had left. We were the last people. Um, there was now my team leader just helping the casualties and, and those guys out there because they were insistent they wanted to stay there and we're like, man. Um, so, I mean, that guy's a true warrior. Uh, and he's, he's still out there. He's, he's doing great work. But we all end up uh, going back to the base to meet live. Uh, you know, because those guys couldn't come. We get back to the base and meet live and immediately the, the general is like not happy. 
like an hour after we arrived, the general, God, I've been I'm so sorry about talking about this for so long. No, it's fun. It's fun. But uh, I appreciate it. Uh, when it happened, when we went on the recon, he had opened up the back of his car. The general went on the recon with us earlier. He had like javelins in there. He had uh, rockets. I took a picture with the rocket like, on the recon. He's like, oh, sweet. You know, this is cool. Um, tons of rockets. We never saw them. There was no javelins with us. We had RPG 22s. All of the Western weapons weren't there. The general had stayed back. Um, obviously, he's a general. He's not supposed to be in the front, but he didn't give us the weapons. He had this car full of 20 weapons, and I, I just didn't see them. So, yeah, we, uh, we get back, and uh, then he gets mad at the internationals because his, uh, his Ukrainian unit took a lot of casualties uh, from this mess. Uh, the, the other like volunteers took a lot of casualties, and all the volunteers had left. All 30 of us. It wasn't just international. It was Ukrainian. Most of them Ukrainian. So we get back, and uh, they kicked out, that, that general kicked out all 30 of us. They were like, you can't be in my region. And I don't blame him. I mean, I don't blame him too bad. I mean, it was a war. We asked for it, and then we got it, and then we were, we were like, oh, shit. I mean, we're just taking casualties. What are we doing here? And everybody had fallen back because it was, it was crazy. But at, at the same time, it was, where were the weapons? I didn't see the rockets. Uh, what are, okay, there's like three tanks coming in. You guys all retreat. What are we doing? You know, we, you didn't give us anything. <laughs> so it was just big confusion. And then, uh, yeah, he got us out of there, uh, all 30 of us. And then I joined the unit uh, that was in the rear, but working on the, they were working on the, the saboteurs that were working in Ukraine. That's when I joined them uh, because that was actually my old, it, it was crazy. I went to that unit because I was, I was suggested to go there because everybody, all the internationals felt bad for me. Like, uh, you know, like, uh, that, that sucks that you're put in that situation. I mean, you know, like you shouldn't be kicked out from our unit, but I got to the, I got to the unit uh, that was out there and it was the 30 Ukrainians. And as we're talking about me, Goliath, because I'm like, yeah, I just got back from me, Goliath. I find out they were there as well. So again, just a small world. Th yeah. Those were the same guys that were in that trench with me. And I, I'm like showing the video and they're like, yeah, that's me. That's me. That's me. Crazy. So that, that's the end of that story. So <laughs> it's so long, but it's no, yeah. mate, that, that, that stuff's great. Um, Something I guess to talk on is you said, you know, that general had all these rockets and javelins and Western supplied weapons yeah. and you didn't have them. How much, how prevalent is that over there? Because, you know, the, the foreign guys I've spoken to is like, oh man, like the corruption and the this and the that and people selling weapons and stealing stuff and whatever. Can you, can you speak us through your experience, I guess, with, because it's known that people, no one wants to talk about things before the war. People yeah. don't realize that Ukraine is, or still was at least, the most corrupt country in Europe. Like, we can't forget that. Like, that is mm. that is a fact. It doesn't mean doesn't mean you hate Ukraine. It doesn't mean you don't support Ukraine. It doesn't mean shit. It's a fucking fact. Yeah. The sky is blue. Um, that, you know, there yeah. is massive corruption, state-level corruption here. Um, can you mm. talk us through your experience with, with that? Because as soon as I speak to someone... Yeah. Honestly, not to keep cutting you off, sorry, but is they're like, oh, yeah, it's oh. fucked. But then I speak to some people online, they're like, oh, yeah, no, it's not too bad. But I speak to them in person, like, oh, it's fucking crazy. They're selling this javelin and this and that. Um, now, I don't know which side to believe in. I'm not a combatant. I haven't come to terms with it. Um, but can you run yeah. us through that that corruption and that, you know, for example, like the, the lack of Western weapons? Yeah, man. I No, I can attest that as well. There was a... I mean, it's not like, it's pretty bad. I, I, I've seen it firsthand. So, you know, the, the time that I saw it, I was actually heading to the hospital. This was months in the future from the time I was talking about. But I was heading to the hospital and we see, uh, we see um, a javelin that's being, or no, it was an in-law. Uh, yeah, it was an in-law. And as, as I'm driving, we're driving in the back of this van and he has us pack up the in-law the into, the, into the van before we leave the base. So I'm driving to the hospital. As soon as we uh, get close to the hospital, uh, they get the vans super close to each other. So, like, they're, they're pretty much combined mm. with another van because there's another van. And we – I don't know where this MLA was going, but we grab that law and we bring it into that van. I, I, I'm not sure who it was for. It was for us. We were using our missions. But now we brought that MLA and we brought it in that van. And uh, after that, they just took me to the hospital. But I was just like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> like, you're just – you're, like, being secretive about this. We just bring up a van really close and so nobody can see it in the street. And we put the, you know, it, it, just crazy, just crazy. Uh, not only that, but yeah, uh, I've seen a lot of, I've heard a lot of stories just like you. 
It's uh, the, These weapons are nowhere to be found as far as I know. I think that general, I've seen him in another video where his unit actually takes out a tank, yeah. and he was with them. I could hear his voice. So I know that he was using them, uh, at least some of them, but he wasn't putting them on the front line. He was like, he was like, uh, I don't know, he was keeping them away, and I, I just got a, I got a bad bad taste in my mouth after that, you know, like, especially seeing that video. I'm like, I mean, awesome you guys took that out, but you got a lot of, a lot of people wanted those weapons when we were being artillery there. We wanted to take out those tanks that were hitting us, you know? So, yeah. And did you ever Yeah, have, I can attest to that. Did you ever have any feeling that they were being sold on, like, a black market? Yeah, yeah, no, a lot of us got that feeling. Um, I, I don't think, I don't think a lot of it, but yeah, some of it was. And it's being cleaned up now. Obviously, the U.S. military went there, um, some advisors and stuff, as we talked about in the last interview. Mm. And as as far as they said, they said, we don't see any wide, like, spread uh, knowledge or, like, information that this is happening. But we do know that at a, at a low level, at least, it's happening. So, mm. yeah, it's it's scary to think about that, you know. It's scary to think about how many of those weapons could be used on the front line that aren't, you know. Yeah, that's a that's a large concern. If you guys are the guys on the front line and it's Western volunteers, Western weapons, you know, you're the most proficient in them and you don't have access to them. Yeah. Although the tax paying people back in America and Australia and Britain and whatever who are supplying these weapons think that there's going to this location to be used on this whatever and it's mm. not is that that's a it's a big problem. It is. Um there's another thing as well. Uh yeah, we got a javelin uh, near the end of my time in Ukraine. Uh, our unit got a javelin, but it was mismatched. They gave us the javelin, but no clue, which is the thing you need to use the javelin. Yeah. So it was just like, like if you're going to give us the javelin, it should be packaged up. Like, was it used before? Like, where's the clue? Like, what? Like, you can't just give us the javelin too. Like, what, what am I going to do? Yeah. So it was really confusing. Um, and not only that, we also had uh, in my unit, they uh, before I had gotten there, my last unit, which was out east. I'd been there for two and a half months or somewhere around there. And uh, one of the guys had shot down a jet with a stinger. Shot down a jet. Uh, one of the internationals. Crazy. And he, when he shot that down, the way it works in Ukraine is if you steal a tank, if you uh, like take a Russian tank, you'll get like $10,000 for your unit or something. Hmm. If you destroy a tank, you'll get like $2,000. If you destroy a jet, you get like 60000 We never saw that money come to our unit. Um, part of the problem was that some of the other units – that were working in that AO, they're like, oh man, that's a lot of money. And they came uh, to Kiev and they said, hey, we shot down that jet. It wasn't them. And then it was a big fight about that. So th there's a lot of like trying to steal money. There's a lot of like, where did the money go? Because we're supposed to get 60,000, but where is it? Um, it's crazy. Yeah, weird stuff. Yeah, th that's fucking wild. Um, have yeah. you heard yeah. anything about the people who have been killed and they don't put them down as like KIA? Um, so their like salary can keep funding the unit. Is that just a, a rumor? Or... Oh wow! I never heard that. that. Must um, be a liar. Yeah, I, I've never I've never been in a unit out there that was getting paid, uh, like paid like a salary. I, I was always a, a volunteered uh, place, so I, I never heard of that. But maybe in the Foreign Legion, I you know, I, I haven't heard that though. Yeah, maybe. No, no worries. I, yeah. I do really appreciate. I guess you're honestly talking about um, the corruption because. It's, you know, not to harp on it, not to, you know, bag it on, but that's, that's prevalent there. And it, it's, you know, you can't, mm -hmm. like, it's something I like to ask people about because I hear horror stories um, from yeah. some and others are different. So I guess everyone has their own experience, don't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I'm still in contact with some of the some of the people out there. You know, I don't want to say, like, too much, mm. not to hide any corruption, but, like, uh, uh, you know, I, I have witnessed more. There's some r really weird stuff. Uh, it, it does exist, but at the end of the day, I've only been in Ukraine. I was only there for four months. I'm going to be going back uh, soon for something else, not frontline stuff. Uh, we were talking about this earlier. Mm. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm sure that the people who have been there years, like Kosak Gundi or whoever it is, can, can attest that in a, in a better light. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. So, so after that mission, who's actually commanding this? Is it the general who's – like, who's actually calling the shots? Because, like you said, you, we yeah. didn't know – who was out in front of us? We didn't know who was behind us. We had no idea who the Russians were. We didn't know if we were falling back. We don't, like, who's actually meant to be fucking commanding this? Because I've heard a lot of guys be like, we thought there was a HR, like a time at when, you know, artillery was coming and all would have air support, and it just never came. Like, yeah. who's actually in command? And if you got shot, you get injured, who are you on the radio to calling in, 
nine line of mist, who's coming to get you? Like, like who's actually commanding this? Or is it just over the top boys, fucking that way, blow the whistle? That's literally what it was. Radios, I never heard of them. Uh, it, it was it was just go out there. We need bodies. Uh, you know, we need bodies out there. And uh, that, that's just how it was. It was as simple as that, really. A uh, little, a little scary. I mean, and I at the end of the day, I don't blame Ukraine at that point. We volunteered to go there. Mm-hmm. They want us to go there. They sent us to like the harshest place. Okay. I mean, that was that was their uh, that was their call. You know, they never they never promised us radius. They never promised us, hey, we're gonna get you out if you get shot. They never promised us anything. They were just like, you want to go out there? There you go. Here's a rifle. Um, and that was at the beginning of the war. They needed bodies, and Russia, you know, yeah. I mean, now. You know that the the stuff that we did at the beginning of the war, that those front lines, a lot of them still hold. Mm-hmm. So like the work that the that the people did at the beginning, the volunteers, the the military that went out against the the giant Russian invasion right at the start, that really made what the war is today. Eight months yeah. later, uh, so you know. Oh, yeah. ab- absolutely, <laughs> mate. The, and I say to people, I don't, I like, don't, uh, I've people in my life who are pro-Ukrainian, pro-Russian, whatever, and I said to people, I don't care what side you're on, You, no one can deny the fighting spirit uh, of the Ukrainian people out there. Like, that's fucking wild. It's a Russian yeah. army. Like, you know, like, holy shit. Like, that, that's, you know, should have been rolled in 48 to 72 hours. And, you know, yeah. I don't know how far in we are now, eight, seven and a half, eight months, whatever it is. Yeah. It's, it is a credit, that, I guess, to that, like, warrior spirit to be able to, to, be able to hold that, especially as just volunteers. And people... People have this idea that these volunteers have had some training. Like, I know I was out in um, Archivob last with guys who, oh, no, 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 that's my farm. Like, I own, this is my farm, yeah. and these guys are at the front line there, and there's some trenches we've dug, uh, and, oh, sweet, we're getting boots. And you're like, wait, you live here? Like, yeah, where are all the farmers from here? And all bloody Igor's land is all occupied now, so he's back here, and we're just out there shooting. And I was like, holy shit, like, this is fucking wild. Wow. It, yeah. It's crazy. I mean, and one one point I do want to make. Um, I I don't know if it's if it'll go on with the with the conversation, but the when it comes to like you you mentioned warriors and the warrior spirit. There's um like one thing one thing I found to be very true. There, there's a saying that there's ninety percent of the people who are in your unit that go to combat shouldn't even be there. Nine percent are the soldiers. One percent is the warriors. I think it was some like Roman philosopher back in the day or something. And I found that to be very true. And, and that, that's part of the reason that I, um, I, I don't think I'm going to do any like frontline stuff in the future because I, I found out out there, I've met warriors. I, I mean, you can see them in my videos. I've met warriors. Those are, those are the true people. We're lucky to have them. Uh, but I, I don't think I'm a warrior. I think maybe a soldier, but it's a uh, man. You learn about yourself so much in combat and you can only know what you're, what you're worth and what, who you are, if you're good in combat, if you, if you go there, um, you know, you can talk all this talk and you can, you can think what you'll do, but when you actually go there, it comes down to the very basic human instincts and you have to know yourself truly. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the fighting spirit is within the Ukrainian people. And even the you know, even if it's 90% of the people shouldn't even be there, they still go. They, they probably know that themselves. They know I shouldn't even be here, but here I am. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think that that really shows the Ukrainian, uh, you know, nation, nationalism and, and everything. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's an attest to you, mate, to, uh, I guess, come to that, come to that realization. Yeah. I mean, I, I try and be honest about it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I don't want to get anybody hurt. I never did. Uh, I don't want to get anybody killed. Uh, but am I, am I, am I some door kicker? Am I a pipe hitter? I don't think so. I don't think so. Mm-hmm. You know, it took me a while to realize that, but I, I don't think so. I mean, I can, I can do a job well, but I'm not a warrior. I'm not somebody who can be fine, uh, fine like that at, at this point. I think that more people, um, the reason I want to be public about that is I want, I want people to see this and I try and be public about it on my, on my YouTube as well. You know, like I want people to see that who are thinking about going to Ukraine or whatever it is and just know like, Hey, if you're, if you're not made of that warrior spirit, you know, for some reason, if you're, if you're not that big macho man, who's going to go out there and kill everybody and you don't think that maybe choose a different thing. I mean, you don't need to go out there and do that. I don't know. What do you think of people, you know, wanting to go and sign up? Do you support it? Yeah. No, totally. Um, I'm just giving my suggestion, you know, just my, my advice. You know, just know yourself truly. 
Uh, it's not a war to be messed around with, especially the Ukrainian war. It's, it's not. Uh, know yourself truly, and you don't want to get anybody hurt, especially if you have no military experience. You're not going to get military training out there. You're going to get a little bit, but it's not It's not enough to instill discipline. It's not enough to, to really um, make you into a, a, you know, a, a, a true soldier as far as NATO standards go. So just be careful. That's all. Yeah. And at what yeah. point in your experience did you come face-to-face -face with the Russians? Um, I mean, honestly, I, I mean, honestly, I, I kind of public about this on my YouTube as, as well. I never fired my rifle at Russians. Yeah. You know, we, we came close plenty of times. I mean, you can see in my first mission, we were close. There's tanks firing at us. They have direct line of sight. Uh, there's small arms fire coming in. Uh, when I was out East as well, there, there is, we would bomb the Russians. We would see their flares come up and, you know, I, this video I just posted about the, the drone mission, we we're about a kilometer away. Um, but face to face with them, no, I, I never, I never saw a Russian face in my, in my, you know, whether it was dead or not. I just never saw them. Just artillery and bombs and <laughs> trying to find them. We tried to find them. We'd go and recon and, you know, we'd see an FO pass by like one of my units did. Um, we would, we would think we would be told before a mission, a hundred percent, you were going to get into engagement, be ready, bring combat gear. You're going to, you know, fight some Russians today and nothing would happen. You know, it would be something different. Yeah. That's just how it goes. Yeah. yeah, and that's something that I want to sort of say to a lot of people I've spoken to is like people have this idea of combat of like clearing rooms and shit like that where the Russians, from what I've seen and the experience I've had with guys, is they don't want to fight like that. They want to fight via artillery. That's how they've always fought is they'll stand back, fire artillery, and if they are guys, they'll want to withdraw and bomb it um, because they've got the most artillery pieces in the world. Um and a lot of guys I know, and a lot of guys are upset because they were like well, this one one gentleman um, who I met in the hospital, and he was fucked up like in a really bad way. And he was saying to me, "It's like, um, man, I've, I've I've done this and I've lost whatever limbs because, and I haven't even seen a Russian. He said, I didn't even see a fucking Z. He said we were ten k's out. Next thing, I see my mate in front of me turn to just pink mist from an artillery shell." I've lost fucking yeah. half my ass and my leg and I'm bleeding out and I've never even seen her. Like, what the fuck is this for? Uh, and that's just, a, yeah. I think that's just um, uh, not, not to have a sad story, but something as far as like, yeah, not seeing the enemy is very, very fucking common. Yeah. It, it's how it is. Um, and even if you get close, you have to think about how big Ukraine is. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're in a giant force, the force we were working in out east, we were working this force. And all the time, like, uh, you know, some of our recon teams that we go out there and one of them sees an FO pass by, a Russian FO, just pass by, 20 meters away from him, but he's in the pro. And he doesn't want to shoot too soon. He wants to wait. And then he just disappears in the whip. So he's still a Russian. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, like, uh, that's, you're not going to find many people. It's very difficult to find. Trying, you know, if you go hunting for deer out in a forest, you know, like, how difficult is that? How, how long do you have to stay out there? It's the same thing out here. I mean, it's so difficult to... Unless you're like 10, 20 meters away, it's difficult to, to even see anybody. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. I, I did find it interesting. You said you haven't had much to do with like dead Russians. Like when, even when I was there, like I bloody dead guys everywhere in some of the um, like recently mm. liberated occupied territories that I'd been. Um, wow. Yeah, it was crazy, man. And it gave me a, a new perspective for the war. I was like, oh, shit, these are just young dudes. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, we were talking about that in the last thing. I've seen... Mm while your podcast it's it's um i mean i, I guess the only time that i've seen like uh destroyed russian anything was we're, back in meek live i mean there was russian as we were driving to the front line there's just russian bmp destroyed yeah. russian tank destroyed russian whatever they would bring stuff back into the base as we were waiting for that operation it would be like a uh, some sort of bmp and we just loot it for its gear and stuff and yeah um but yeah never never saw never saw anything like on the ground anything um yeah. That's just how it goes, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, ninety nine point nine percent of soldiers have never fired their rifle in combat. That's you know, that's I never have. <laughs> like I was in Afghan for nine months, I never fired my rifle. Um in, in, it's a, it is, in yeah. contact. That's just that's just the the real nature of people play Call of Duty and you're like, you can't have that all the time. <laughs> you have any idea how fatiguing that would be? Like and how many guys would yeah. actually die? It's crazy. I, yeah. I mean there there's some people, I mean, there's some videos of people going into trenches, going into houses. Mm -hmm. Uh, that Korean guy, the, the Korean guy, he, he did some awesome work and he, 
you know, his, his team, when they're in Kiev, he's posting the videos now. It's amazing. Uh, oh, what's his, what's his name? I, kind of oh, I forget. It, it's the, the Korean Rock Seal. Rock Seal, I think it's his YouTube. Right. I'm yeah, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Rock Seal, he, he seems really cool. Um, yeah, he was, uh, I mean, he had, he'd done some crazy stuff, but you have to, you have to really push and, and you have to be kind of lucky in order to get some, some actual combat time. Um, it takes many months and people wait. I've been, in, I've been in Iraq, Syria, Ukraine. I never fired my rifle at anybody. <laughs> yeah. And that's just me. I mean, I know, I know a lot of people who did, but for myself, I'm not here to go and blow smoke up your ass. I, I never did. Yeah. And I, I don't think people should be afraid to say that. I mean, yeah, it's most people don't. That's okay. That's okay. You did the job. You tried your best. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. How much experience yeah. with, I guess, like um, injured, killed Ukrainians did you have? You know, if you're in these positions and there's artillery coming in bloody everywhere, there, there's got to be a lot of yeah. a lot of casualties and some very serious injuries. Well, when I was out east, yeah, um, I, I didn't see them. Um, but, yeah, it, it just comes down to luck. We'd be staying at our base. And then one of my bases would be, you know, those checkpoints they have like every kilometer on the yeah. road. Yeah. There's a checkpoint. It had just freshly been bombed. And some of my team had just passed by and, oh my God, there they are. And it was freshly bombed. Smoke still everywhere. So they went there and they, they passed some people up. There's some dead people, um, Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, but the only, the only time that I actually saw like anybody injured other than a meek live, just slight wound on the hand. And, um, and, uh, yeah, that was in the hospital when I, when I went to the hospital mm. because I went there for pneumonia. I arrived and then uh, I, I went down to the, the ICU, you know, like the, the area where, you know, I went down and so many people injured from shrapnel, but there's some fresh people too, like people walking in with still blood running down like a like hundred holes in them, just walking around, getting patched up as they walk. It, mm. it, was, it was weird as hell in a hospital. Um, that, that, was, that was pretty much the only time that I saw like, uh, like uh, somebody injured like that was at the hospital. I don't know. I don't know where the hell that was. That was in Kharkiv. So he must have just gotten sent from the front line straight to the hospital and he was just still fresh. Weird. Yeah, well that front but, line right there is so is so close and it's 15 20 k. You're sitting in the city arc, you're having a coffee and it's just bang bang shelling. You're like, "What the fuck?" But incoming out gun, you're like, "What the <laughs> fuck?" Like people don't realize yeah, that the city of Kharkiv, which is the second biggest city in Ukraine, is within artillery range of the Russian border. Like it's 30, like, I tell people before the war, before the war started, you know, mid-February, I wanted to go to the Russian border. Um, I got an Uber. Like, I just I just got an Uber to the border. It was only, like, 30 kilometers away. Um, I don't realize how close that is. That Kharkiv used to be, if I'm if I'm correct, it used to be the actual, the capital of Ukraine. Now it's Kiev. It's still a very large city, mm -hmm. and you can see the scars of war there a lot. Yeah. No, yeah, if you want to see, like, yeah, a city, a city like you see on the news and stuff. Probably mm -hmm. a lot of the probably a lot of the news that you see is probably from the Kharkiv city. Yeah. It's uh, everything everything is shelled out. Everything's bombed out. You try and find. I mean, even even when the Russians had, were like sort of far back, uh, we'd be in Kharkiv city, and when you walk around the train station to just down the street, there's artillery everywhere. Every building is marked up with shrapnel. Yeah, it's a, it's like a city like Detroit. I'm I'm from Detroit. Mm -hmm. You look at Detroit, imagine that. You know, even worse than it is today. Yeah. It's uh, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, I guess after that, and um, you know, you moved yeah. units. What, what? Where did you go in Ukraine then? And you had got pneumonia, and what? What? What happened then? Yeah. So, um, it was back in Kiev. I got I got COVID. I got COVID when I was in when I was in Kiev before that operation. Real battle. And then wounds, after that mate. operation. <laughs> Uh, sorry. Real battle wounds, fucking the Rona. Yeah. <laughs> and then I went to, um, so I, I carry Kiev and uh, I carry COVID in Kiev. And I, I think that I'm, it might have contributed to the pneumonia, but the pneumonia didn't come out until uh, three months into Ukraine, mm. um, the actual pneumonia. But after, after Meek Live, after my stuff in that other unit that was, you know, sort of in the rear, but against saboteurs, uh, I spent, you know, two and a half months out east. And my, my friend had invited me. I never knew that he was there until, you know, a couple of days before he invited me and he was an old Marine Corps buddy. And he said, Hey, like, I don't know if you guys want to come out here, but I've got a really good unit. We're doing some really, really good work and we'd love to have you guys. And, uh, so I brought me and my medic friend who was from that other group and we went over, uh, we just took a train over. We hopped in, uh, with, a we brought a buddy of mine, an old Marine Corps buddy as well. Mm. Um, not buddy, but acquaintance, somebody in my unit. Yeah. 
and uh, we hopped in the train together. He had just arrived to Ukraine, so I was just sort of explaining things like, yeah, we're going to be going there. It seems like Kharkiv, you know, we're going to be okay, and then we're going to get to our base and sort of explain the situation. Yeah, I um, I got to that unit out east, and the, the person who picked me up from the train station at Kharkiv was somebody, random person, again, in a small world, somebody I had met in Kiev. Uh, they're like, 10 people that were in uh, Kiev just waiting to get into a unit. It was one of those guys. Um, I was like, oh, how's it going, dude? <laughs> so he picks me up, and we, uh, yeah, we, we get to our base out east. Yeah. Shit. And from yeah. there, that, what did you do? Yeah, so that was that was right outside of Balaklaya, uh, back when Balaklaya was Russian held. Mm. Uh, about a month and a half ago, it was retaken by the, the Ukrainians, luckily, but... That, that used to be a very heavy front line, and we were there next to Izium as well, Izium, Balaklaya, uh, those sort of areas. And the front line was very stagnant. So uh, most of the missions that we did was recon. Uh, we would go into villages. One of the last videos I'm posting my like combat experiences or combat missions or whatever, uh, is going to be me uh, with my team, and we're, we were sent out to go into this village. We were told 100% there are Russians here, there are no civilians, and you're going to get into combat. We're like, okay, so we brought our in-law, we brought everything we had, and our six-man team went into that village. I mean, when we get to that village, uh, man, there was, there were civilians there. We, we arrive, and we're clearing into a house because we wanted to sleep the night there to go and uh, sort of get an idea of what's going on this, in this area is at nighttime and stuff. So we get there, and then we're, clearing the, we're clearing the house, and then we hear a dog barking. I'm like, oh, shit. And uh, we're like, uh, why is there a dog? He sounds healthy. He sounds like, you know, he's been there. And a guy, an old man, walks out of the house. He says, hey, how's it going? And I'm like, what the hell? The Russians used to go into this village, like, every, every day. They would go into this village with tanks and FOs. They would come in, bombard the, the place that we would be staying, um, the sort of frontline position of the Ukrainians, and then they would retreat. So this was sort of a gray area, but the Russians would use it a lot. Yes. When we asked this, when we asked this uh, civilian aide, like, where, where are the Russians? He's like, there's no Russians. So he might have been, he might have been somebody who sided with the Russians or not. I'm not sure. But we we carried on. We went into um, one of the forests that was probably about like 600 meters away from the known Russian trench with like DPR and LPR, and uh, we didn't see them. There was sort of like a, a long hill, so we couldn't see them. But we got to this trench line. We didn't know who made it, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we cleared out. Nobody was there, but it was freshly dug. There were some wire as well. So I, I point out, hey, there's wire in here. Be careful. There might be IEDs. Um, so our friends checked the IEDs. There's there's nothing there, no IEDs. Okay. And uh, we pushed in even further because there was nobody here except for civilians. There's no Russians. So we're like, okay, let's push into the next town, which was super risky, but we did. And uh, as soon as we get halfway, we see some people. This is crazy. We see uh, two guys in black uniform. This might be a Russian. This might be the only time I saw Russians. And um, they were about 400 meters away, 400 meters, across the field. So the way that the villages work is there's like a village, farmland, village, farmland. It's about a kilometer of farmland in between these villages. Mm. So we were crossing to the next village, which we knew had Russians in it. Uh, but we wanted, to, we wanted to figure something out. So as we're crossing uh, to that village, yeah, we see 400 meters out, two uh, people dressed in black at a distance. So that usually means uniform. Uniforms a lot of times look black at a, at a distance. And we, we see those two black uniforms. They stop as they're walking. They stop. I mean, you couldn't see if they were looking at us, but then they sprint to cover. And we're like, oh, shit. <laughs> they sprint to cover. And uh, at that point, I, I thought it was FOs because they, you know, they've been accurately hitting our positions for like a month now. They have FOs in the area. And uh, at that point, we uh, we got to this uh, we got to this river to take some cover, like try and figure out what's going on. We get the binoculars out. They had fled. Those guys had fled. Um, that we couldn't see them in the cover anymore. Maybe they were hiding underneath there. But they had seen us because they had stopped. Both of them like talked to each other, stopped for like five seconds, and then ran away. So at that point, we we decided, okay, we're gonna we're gonna push back. This is looking. They obviously saw us, and uh, so we like 300 meters away from that village, we decided to push back. And uh, that was one of the missions, you know. We, we had a lot of missions like that, a lot of recon, a lot of, a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess for those um, who don't know, FO forward observer, um, pretty much go out there. Typically, sometimes in ghillie suits, whatever, and they are the ones with like binoculars, GPS, who call in um, artillery and also see what like damage. Like, if you want to bomb a town, 
you have you, know, you get someone out there binoculars on a hill say look at it okay this is at this grid this altitude blah 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 right call it in to the artillery line and then can as the artillery comes in say it overshoots you can say oh yeah come back you know 100 meters come back 200 meters and you can like bracket it onto location um and then they can also be like oh well look fire for effect you know and then yeah targets killed whatever so an fo is a very like um of course every military has them um very like um a big target i guess because you're out way out the front by yourself or in a pair of two um but like jtacs people probably more um yeah. I deal with, the, with JTAC. JTAC means you can have like fast air, and then you have like JFEC in the Australian Army, which I, I think is non fast air, but it's like artillery mortars, something like that. I could be completely wrong, but that's like their job. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that, you know, that, that could be out there, man. That could be fucking everywhere because the amount of artillery that's coming in is crazy. They're a big target, man. They're, they're really, really, if you can find an FO, you try and kill them. Um, yeah. <laughs> Where do you think you'll see this war leading in the next? six months oh man um i've heard some rumors i think kersan will be taken um i'm i'm hoping praying to god praying to god uh kersan needs to be taken that's that's just across the river and i think that the ukrainians can do it um obviously it's a slower push than what we saw in kharkiv when they when they took like 70 kilometers uh when the ukrainians did but i think kersan will be taken next other than that i don't see significant progress on the front lines personally i was never in the zaporizhia region uh, i'm sure that you have um i've never been like down in the in the southeast mm. at, at all so I, I don't know exactly what that looks like but i think it's gonna be kind of stagnant personally maybe people people are throwing out peace deals i i have no idea i have no idea yeah yeah what what would you think about a peace deal with your experience there or do you think of mm. the, the, the cost has been too much because I, uh, I i can actually see it from both yeah. sides that the cost for both ukraine and russia is so much that neither want to sign a peace deal because like even if like ukraine yeah they would be like well why the fuck would we give up anything of ours why would we sign a peace deal which i completely yeah. can agree with and side with but then i get it from russians being like well why would we sign one if we've already killed eighty thousand troops um yeah 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 it's it's a crazy a crazy thing i Honestly, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a historian. I'm not any of those things. But mm. I think what uh, a possible reality of this is that the front lines remain. Ukraine keeps trying to push for many, many years. Yeah. You know, they did this since 2014. I mean, it'll be nothing new. They'll continue that until Russia falls. It looks like Russia is, is not doing good economically. They're not doing good politically. Uh, they're trying their best to find alliances within Iran and North Korea now. Um, they're obviously on their last legs, and I, I think that, I think that, that's the, that's the end goal that might be a possibility. It's just wait for the Russians to, to just, you know, like lose. I mean, the Russians, the Russian government is gonna, at some point, crumble. It's looking pretty obvious at this point. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a, it's an interesting take to see if, to see if that will crumble. But I guess that the rebuttal could be does ukraine and the western support have the time to put to that yeah. like because if it's going to be years is it man it's already a big cont contested thing coming into elections and stuff of people being like what the fuck are we sending a billion dollars overseas for um yeah, yeah so yeah, that that i have no doubt that ukraine could do it but it's going to be how long how much longer are people willing to deal with that i guess yeah and they also need that western support so you're right i mean uh Without that Western support, they're, you know, they they're they're having a problem. But they're getting a lot of Western support, not only in militarily like weapons, but also training. You can yes. see the UK training, you know, thousands of them. So we'll see we'll see how it continues. Um, I don't think either side wants to give up, like you said. So um, it might just come down to, like I said, twenty years in the future when Russia finally just stops being Russia, you know, as we know it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And Maybe. what do you think is next for yourself? Yeah, for myself, um, you know, right now I'm chilling. Uh, I'm going to get back home. I'm in Indonesia right now traveling. Uh, I'm going to go back home. I'm going to spend some time with my family for Christmas. And then after that, I'm I'm thinking about going back to Ukraine, not in a military way. Uh, again, we talked about this earlier. I I don't think I'm I don't think I'm made for, you know, this, this combat nowadays. I mean, I, I did a good job, but, you know, everybody would say that I 
you know, I was a good soldier out there. They, they were happy to have me and they want me to go back there. They're like, Oh, you don't want to come back to the unit. I'm like, <laughs> it's just not for me anymore. Yeah. So I, I want to go back out there. I want to, I want to help out the people I can. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do, but, uh, I've got some links with training organizations, uh, from various friends. So I, I might pick up one of them. Uh, one of them offered me uh, a place. So yeah, just training for a couple months, whatever it is. And we'll see from there. Yeah. And yeah. what about, what about long-term? What, what do you see yourself doing? Yeah. Long-term. I, I might continue YouTube. Um, it's looking, YouTube is so weird. Yeah. I mean, some, some videos will, yeah, some videos will blow up and oh. others that you work on forever won't. Um, yeah. it's really random, but I see that there's an audience, you know, that just like you have, there's an audience of thousands of people who want to see like true content like this. And, um, as long as they're there, I'll be here for them. And it's, it's sustaining, uh, financially sustaining, um, like uh, meaningful wise. So uh, I'll continue YouTube for now. <laughs> In what, what capacity, yeah. what, what, if you weren't going to, I guess, to war zones, cause that's what most of your content, you've got some early stuff of like your van life yeah. stuff, which is very different, but if, cause I've, yeah. I've thought about this too with my YouTube and you make bring up a good point. Cause like only yesterday I was going off. I put a video out yesterday that I thought was one of the best I've done in, in some of the bunkers and the trenches with the guys. Um, yeah, I watched that one. I thought, I thought it was a good video and just absolutely just flat. Like it was the worst performing one I've had. And that's very difficult. Um, like I know financially I could not support, I uh, sorry, I could not um, completely like just have YouTube. It would kill me. Yeah. Um, so I have other income streams, but um, mm. I know that, you know, my content, I sort of get stressed cause I'm like, shit, I have to, I have to go back to war to, to make content. Like I, I'm going to have to go, know, I'm going to have to go to Ukraine or Nigeria yeah. or uh, Iraq or Syria or like somewhere. And I'm like, and I need to do it like soon. And I'm like, I don't really want to, I want to have a couple months at home, but will this just die? Like, do you, do you have any idea what, what you're going to go into? Cause I might, I might steal your idea. <laughs> <laughs> I know, man. No, I'm on the same page as you. Yeah. Because my comment footage is going to run out and what happens then, yeah. you know? Um, I think, but honestly, I think that most of the people on the channel, on, on your channel, my channel are here for, for us. You know, um, I think that if we start like, uh, whatever it is, if we, if we start just a series of some sort of videos, I think they'll, they'll respond. Well, um, I've seen that with the van life content. I mean, I've got some, most of the people here for combat footage and you know, my time in Ukraine, but other people are here for van life stuff. Mm. And, um, I, I think that, I think that I could transition it. And I think that you could as well, like any, any content you would want to make, people are going to be there for you, man. Yeah. You know, people, people, people enjoy our, our content, whatever it is. And I mean, yeah, you, the YouTube algorithm, sometimes I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing. This is really weird. Speaking on YouTube, I have this, uh, this short video of me shooting a, a clash. I was like, Hey, this is my Russian ACAM. Here's me shooting it. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, it was interesting. I posted it a year ago, mm. uh, about a month ago. It had like maybe 10,000 views. And uh, the last month, it is now almost a million views. Yeah. It, that's how YouTube goes. So that's these are like long burns and you never know, like uh, you can't look at the success of it like uh, right from the beginning. Some of these videos, um, and I see in the comments as well from your comments and mine, like these videos are going to be for years to come. People are going to look back at this to go and get a better look at the Ukrainian war. You know, you know our children, you know, like whatever, whatever. Like people in the, people in the future generations are going to look at our videos and our commentaries you know, at the sort of thing. So I think it's a, it's a long burn, if anything. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate, appreciate the inspiration, mate. Cause I've been like having this feeling of, Oh my God, everything's, everything's fucking crumbling around me. I need to, I need to do something. <laughs> I need to do something else. Dude, same, know. same. <laughs> do you, um, as someone with a large, what do you got? A quarter million subscribers on YouTube? Something like that. Um, oh, man, I, yeah. 300,000, 300,000, 300, just hit it. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever get like any, like sense of almost anxiety because you're well known. Like, do you ever think like shit, like going to Ukraine, like, cause of course a lot of people love you, but of course with that, there's going to be people that dislike you and I'm the same, you know? Um, yeah. there's a lot of people that do a lot of people fucking hate me. Do you ever get like a bit yeah. of anxiety from, from that going into dangerous places with weapons and alpha people? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, but honestly, I, I probably, probably a lot like yourself, like, uh, I don't, I don't fear death to the point where I'll stop doing what, what I want to do. Um, I certainly don't fear if I don't, if I don't fear like death in that sort of manner, I, I don't fear, you know, I, I fear death. I mean, I'm, I'm not Mr. Yeah. Like, Oh, I don't care, but you know, you know what I mean? Um, 
I, I certainly don't, I don't fear uh, people disliking me. I, I try and be not open and honest as possible. I try not to make drama. Um, and in a foreign fighter community, there's a lot of drama, but yeah, as for, as for the crazy people, um, actually, if, if I can talk about this shortly, there's I actually two months ago, I had a stalker. I had to sign a PPO, a personal protection order. Um, some weird shit, man. There's uh, there are some crazy people, but it, you just got to continue with life. So I'm, I'm going to keep doing what I want to do and we'll see what, what happens. If I, if I get killed and, you know, shot in the back of the head, you know, a year from now, you know, look back at this podcast and know that, Hey, I, I knew it was coming. <laughs> might, it might flow in a whole bunch of new views, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you have the rights to go and uh, publish that video and, uh, and speak on, speak on it. No worries. Yeah, fuck, I just, this is going to be a clip. He predicted, it's like a 10 minute clip. Like he predicted his own death. Ooh, yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe it's me who does it just to give my channel a bit of a fucking revamp. <laughs> have you had many of your foreign mates who have gone to Ukraine to fight? Have, have many of them been killed? Well, um, I'm not going to speak on specific names, but mm, of course. <sighs> well, uh, yeah. So killed. Thank God. I have no idea how, but no. Right. Injured. Everybody in my past unit. Um, so pretty much my my last unit out east. Our last mission was planting mines. Uh, that video is on my YouTube. There, you know, we planted mines. We we got really close to them. Um, everything. We did our work, and uh, as soon as we got back, uh, we were discussing with our leadership where should we go. Um, you know, we we want to we want we, we had different ideas. The leadership had different ideas from what we wanted. So we decided to disband the unit, and we we're going to go our separate ways. Mm. But our unit liked each other. So we all. I gave them the contact. Somebody I met in the hospital, which is the general to the foreign legion. Uh, not a general, but a you know battalion commander. I met him in the hospital, and he he loved the idea of us coming to him. Some experienced military experience, combat experience guys, and uh, he needed team leaders because I met some of his team leaders who were injured in the hospital. So the people who stayed in Ukraine, which was probably about half of my unit, um, another half decided to leave to go back home, like I did, because I had pneumonia at that point. I you know it was just time for me to rest. But those uh, those half of the guys, probably like six or seven, decided to stay. Right. And they went to that foreign legion uh, unit and they were doing a, a big push. I'm not going to say exactly where, I, I don't know if they're public about it too much, but uh, they're making you know a push a month and a half ago. And they were, I'm not going to say their story for them, but they were all injured. Um, one of them took uh, uh, a piece of shrapnel or a bullet, something through uh, the cheek, one side of the cheek came out and exploded half his jaw off. Right. Uh, another international I've never met, but he, uh, he took a piece of shrapnel straight through the Kevlar, killed him instantly. Um, and all the other guys that I know from my unit that are still out there were injured in various ways. One of them was in the liver and the lung. He had, a uh, you know, big stuff, liver and lung. Um, and, uh, the other had shrapnel in his leg. Another had a piece of shrapnel stick to his spine, the back of his spine. Um, everybody was injured horrifically, but everybody was making a full recovery. And they're going to continue their work. And that is that is what made me realize that, look, like I had pneumonia. And, you know, obviously I'm not going to be beneficial on the battlefield if I have pneumonia. I need to take a break. Those guys need to take a break too. But the fact that most of those guys are going to stay there after getting those horrific injuries, they're going to recover. And they're going to go back. A lot of them. And if they don't, if they decide in the future, no, I, I think I'm done, that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Those guys are true heroes and those are true warriors. Yes. I don't think I, don't think I could be in that place that they are and continue the fight. Like, I don't, I don't think I could. And that's, that's why I'm straying away from the combat sort of side of things. I don't think I'm, th those are true warriors. I, yeah. A lot of those guys are, everybody I know that's out there in my, from my old unit are injured now. Yeah. yeah. What you said. You mentioned yeah. laying mines. Um, can you talk us through sort of, I guess, doing that and your um, thoughts on that? Because laying mines is something that Western armies, as far as um, uh, personal, like set, like you tread on it and it goes off mines. We're not allowed to do, um, you know, yep. Geneva convention and Haiti treaty, all this stuff has stopped us having purse initiated weapons. So, you know, we can have yeah. a claymore that is out there and we push the clacker and it explodes you. But as far as actually putting something on a trip or on something where you like an IED or a, a traditional like landmine people think of, we are not allowed to do. And it's your training in the Marines. Um, yeah doesn't exist or i guess it doesn't exist it's something that's like no yeah. that's a no-no because uh, and the reason i ask you is because landmines are notorious for having very little actual battlefield effect 
on enemy mm. soldiers, but a massive effect on the um, community population in that area because it's area yeah. denial. It's it, well, it's a correct term, I believe, is area denial weapon because it, it stops you being able to farm the land. It stops civilians walking through there, and it kills an absolute shitload of animals. Like I went to a farm uh, out east, northeast, and Harkiv out past like um, Saltivka that this farmer lost like yeah. 400 of his cattle to landmines. Um, oh, yeah. And of course that has massive flow on effects for the community and people lose, there's still people to this day losing limbs in places and whatever from, yeah. and landmines are just, it does, it, from any country that laid them, what, what is your thoughts on, on laying them as, I guess, a Western soldier? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, yeah, no, obviously, when we when we did plant mines, we marked them with GPS. We had a Garmin on us. We marked the exact locations. We also wrote on the map, like, real time while we were there. We wrote on the map where they are exactly, exactly. Mm. And uh, as soon as we got back to the base, we gave them all that information. Um, as far as, like, uh, yeah, mines, like, there's other mines we made as well um, that we're just allowed to do, like IEDs and stuff. Mm. Um, we would, we would make, we could make daisy chains and make, and make different things. And that, that was part of the job out there. Of course, yeah. uh, the Ukrainians need that at that point. Um, but honestly, I think most of the mine casualties are going to be coming from the cluster bombs. I'm sure you saw plenty of those canisters yes. everywhere. They're everywhere. And like, oh my God, they pocket the entire farmland. You see like three, like of the canister, like things, mm. you know, like in the, just dug in the, in the farmland. Yeah. Um, it's freaky as hell. And those are the, I think those are the real killers, especially for like, like cattle and stuff. Personally, I, I think if they were to just nick it a little bit, I mean, it could, it could really, really hurt you um, and kill you. And um, yeah, there's so many cluster bombs that the Russians are using. I've never seen the Ukrainians use it. I don't know if they're using them, but I think that's, that's the, the, the I would never, I would never send a cluster bomb. If I, if I was in that position, I could send a cluster bomb. I would never do it, you know, but a mine that I can place and GPS track and everything that I know like a heavy vehicle has to go over in order to, you know, land on it. And also I know that, you know, there's the tracks of the Russian vehicle and it was just there 20 yeah. minutes before I planned that mine, I find that okay. Yeah. So, so were they mainly yeah. anti-tank mines, not anti-purse? Yeah. Yeah. Only, only anti-tank. Um, yeah. We had some ideas for anti-personnel. Uh, when we were getting ready to defend this village, we thought that there was a bunch of Russians coming. So we were planning out uh, an ambush uh, where we were going to put some mines on the road and then also some daisy chained, uh, uh, different explosives on the on the edge where they would dismount and take cover, mm. and then we had like an RPG shot ready, you know everything. Uh, but everything, everything, it was nothing. It was nothing that the that the Ukrainians. Uh, there was no Ukrainian civilians in the area. Is all I'm saying. Yeah. Oh yeah. no. And and you know like I, you know yeah. Ukraine or Russia neither have signed the Geneva Convention. They are fine to use, basically whatever the fuck they want. Um, you know humanitarian yeah. crimes one thing, but neither sides cl signed cluster munitions and both sides. There's evidence of both sides mm. using a, a very similar munitions like that in areas where yeah. there's civilians and mines and whatever, you know, that, that's, mm -hmm. it's well documented on, on both sides, but you know, I just want to put it out there wow. because people, someone will jump on me and go, oh, but neither sign. My, my thing is I don't care if you've signed or not signed the, the conventions and the, these treaties humanly it's yeah. fucking wrong um you know yeah. like yeah. yeah so no that's something yeah it's just something i, I found i found um funny because i have a, a friend of mine who was uh, a, a green beret um uh, ex uh, american army green beret very experienced guy mm. pulling out mines he's actually coming on this and him being like mate i don't know which fucking countries we were pulling out he's like they're all the same and both it's a fucking mess he's like we had no idea where they were we're pulling out Ukraine ones, Russian ones, and we asked the farmer, we're on the land, and he said, we think these were, we, we think they were Ukrainian mines, but we're not sure. And he said, we asked the farmer if he had any, and he's like, I didn't even know there were mines on my land. And I'm like, fuck, <sighs> like this is, is, this creates a massive fucking issue in like in that area. And all. But I just, uh, very interesting, yeah. you know, uh, the reason I'm interested in your, uh, you know, experiences doing that as a Western soldier is interesting to me. Yeah, and I'll tell you another thing going on with that, agreeing with you. The, many of the missions that we went on, uh, when we got there, we would get a sit rep like, okay, here's the Ukrainian unit here, there's this. And I think that I think the biggest problem for Ukraine right now, at least back in the day, this is, again, like three months ago, four months ago, was that the communication on where Ukrainian units are mm. to reduce friendly fire, which we had a friendly fire incident as well. Um, not, I, I didn't take part in it, um, and it was totally by accident. No, nobody's at fault, but... It was just because nobody told us where the Ukrainians were. Yeah. 
Yeah. And also with the mines, the mines all the time, they'd be like, oh yeah, there's a minefield here, there's a minefield here, and there's a minefield here. It's like, can you show me on the map? No, uh, it's just over in this direction. I don't think they have a clue either. You know, it's just freaky, man. Uh, I, think, I think like what they really need is just put on a map, like the generals need to have their stuff together and like really like find out exactly what the units are doing in that area. Where are they? And be able to like have that real time for everybody else in the area. Um, actually, if I, if I can go on a small tangent, there was yeah. another instance, one on a mission. We were, we were uh, demining an area because we wanted to use this road. And there was this yellow bus that was carrying, it's on my YouTube as well. There's a yellow bus that was a month prior carrying some uh, civilians. They were, humanitarian they were bringing some in the back of the vehicle there was like salt and sugar and chai and all this stuff and they hit a mine or something and it blew up so we were there to demine it before that we had went to we had went to the base to go and ask the commanders hey we're going to be uh, going and operating in this area here we are we wanted to just be transparent with them they left the area they left the area and uh, the day after the Russians had came and taken that area. So we arrived and like all the, all the trees are pocketed with shrapnel. Um, the place is abandoned. There's no commanders there. So we can't tell anybody that we're operating. Yeah. And uh, then the day after, like the Russians had came and taken over and one of our units, not international, but another uh, special forces group, they went over there thinking the same thing. Like, okay, the, the commanders are here. This is where they used to be. And the Russians were there. Some, some like Wagner or something killed one of them, killed one of the Ukrainians. And that's just how it goes. It's like uh, the the command needs to be able to tell the soldiers where they are, what's going on, real time. They need they need to have faster input on that because it's getting people killed, it's, and not just soldiers but also civilians. Yeah. So, so yeah. if you just excuse me for a second, I'm going to scroll because there are some comments of people um, who've asked you some specific uh, questions. Um, yeah, let's go for it. Me being an idiot, I didn't actually write these down uh, beforehand. But, <laughs> it's fine, dude. Yeah, man. It's, it's very, very, you know, this is the most casual thing in the world. And that's where you're like, you're like, oh, if you're, if you're, um, uh, you're like, oh, sorry, I'm going to go on a tangent. I'm like, bro, this is fucking very <laughs> chill. Um, it's the place to do it. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. I appreciate of course. it. Uh, here we go. <laughs> it's like a lot of people like complimenting you. Um, there's always people copping shit to nice. both of us as well. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, uh, if oh yeah, here's one. If and when uh, Taiwan gets invaded, uh, will you mm. go boots on the ground? If so, why? Why not? Oh, Taiwan! I, I never thought about that. Um, obviously, I've been keeping up with the news, but boots on the ground. I've already made my decision. I, I don't uh, find myself going in the front line um, anymore. I I think that going there to go and help medically or something else training that's that's a possibility. Mm. I would definitely want to help in some way. And if I knew if I knew a lot of my friends that were going there because I don't speak Cantonese or whatever they they speak there. Yeah. Uh, then yeah, possibly I could have an, an avenue to go there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they go. Uh, oh, they ask. Uh, what was shooting the animal in the tunnel? Uh, in the oh Turkish yeah, I saw that one. <laughs> Yeah. The, okay. So there's the Turkish dog, but also in the in the prior one, I showed me a uh, uh, shooting the 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 porcupine, the Africanized porcupine yeah. <laughs> in a, in Iraq. And uh, yeah, no, that one that one was crazy. Uh, that's just like in the in the tunnels in Iraq. There's a lot of porcupines. There's a lot of snakes, spiders, everything, and uh, they're very aggressive and dangerous. They carry rabies, all stuff. So whenever you see one, it's you kill them, and you don't just kill them. You eat anything you kill. So we also cooked out that porcupine, cooked up others that we killed. Yeah. Um, but as far as the dog, yeah, I mean, when it comes to the dog, yeah, the, the Turkish military uses dogs to sort of like scout out the tunnels and stuff. Mm. Um, not in my area, but in Northern Iraq. Yeah. Yeah. It's fucking yeah. wild. I think everything yeah. else we've, we've basically covered, um, covered in this, mate. Nice one. Yeah. Oh, mate. Well, look, unless there's anything else, I, um, I really appreciate your time today, you know, an hour and 40 minutes, whatever it's been, it's, um, it's been great, mate. I, I really appreciate it. And I can't wait to, you know, do this again. But like I always say, it'd be, it's always better to have a beer and be in the studio together. Of course. You know, uh, I really appreciate it, man. This, uh, you know, that the rock one was really, really nice interview. Uh, I was super glad to get a lot of stuff off my chest and just talk about that. And then also with this one, I feel like I could talk about a lot of stuff that, you know, I think only people on your, on your channel, you got a really nice channel to go and say whatever, whatever's on my mind. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Well, is there is there anything else you haven't you've haven't said that you'd like to say? Um, 
No, I, I think uh, pretty much everything's said. Uh, you know, I talked about a lot of the different operations, a lot of the, you know, the reasoning behind the different decisions and stuff. And I think it's pretty good. Yeah, I appreciate it. Mate, no, that's fine. I and mean, you know, the door's always open to yourself and other people who um, who would like to come on in and talk about stuff. I can't take everyone, of course, but you know, I've still got to still got to put food on the table somehow, and, and you know, have time to make dinner. So, <laughs> you know, no, but yeah, um, but I really appreciate it. So, Siftiv, um, thank you for sharing your experience, and um, me and I'm sure everyone else will be very um, very keen to see where where your travels and your content and everything takes you next. Sounds good. I appreciate the questions as always, man. Uh, thank appreciate you, brother. It. Okay, I'll speak to you soon. Right. Yeah. Sounds good. All uh, right, see ya. See ya.